Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Tan uh, se Neil Larry Campbell. It's Jay Tano Tayan, Kikis to Yutta Mehana Wami Um Very happy to be here today. It's it's uh, it's an honor to be over here. I um I have uh, been to this campus twice now in in uh, this year, and, and uh, I found it much easier this time um, than I did last time. But uh, now that I have tobacco, I actually need to speak to that. I didn't know I was getting that, so that's going to preface sort of everything we go with today. So, um, uh, so Amina, I've met her uh, in my role as director of the Waterloo Indigenous Student Center, and uh, have connected with her through that and. Um, but uh, the gift of a tobacco tie, uh, when, it, when it's presented to, to somebody, um, when the person is making the tobacco tie, tobacco is one of our sacred medicines. And when the tobacco tie is being made, or when Amina would have made the tobacco tie, uh, what goes into the tobacco or the medicine during that making uh, are thoughts and, and uh, um, hopes and or fears or any of those types of things are going into that medicine and the creation of the tobacco tie but with the intent of what it was that Amina has asked me to come here to do today and so all of that goes into the medicine and uh, when you're giving a tobacco tie or the gift of tobacco the person that you're giving it to um, may or may not accept it uh, for various reasons uh, generally the reasons for non-acceptance are I'm sorry I'm not going to be here that day or, you know what, um, I think you, know, you should present that to so-and-so because I think they might be um, much more able to speak to what it is that you've asked or what it is that you've asked for. Uh, that's not to say that I think I'm the best speaker about this topic today, but um, it, it uh, made sense for me to come today given uh, my work with Amina and uh, my relationship to this university. So. Having the tobacco tie then here today, also now everybody that's in this room and a part of the conversation here today um, has thoughts and ideas of what it is that you hope to learn, um, questions you have uh, um, in guiding your work with Indigenous peoples um, or gaining a better understanding. So all of that and all of our conversation in a, in a good way uh, goes into the medicine as well. And then when I have opportunity to be at a ceremonial fire, um, I will take this and the other tobacco ties that I have from various other uh, work that I do on campus. And um, while at the fire, I will um, think about each tobacco tie and what was within it and the intention within it and the work that was done. And then we'll offer it into the fire and the um, burning of it and the smoke carries up all of that to the creator who then will carry on all of our thoughts and, and our conversation today and, and uh, help oversee all of that for us as we move forward. So I thank you for that, Amina. Uh, other than that, I would just like to start off here quickly with a short little video. Some of you may have seen it before, but if, if we could just watch that and then I'll, and then I'll share a little bit more, I'd appreciate it. where you live, how can you ever feel welcome there? The Indigenous Placemaking Council seeks to restore Indigenous presence to Canadian cities, towns and communities.
All right, so I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not an architect. That is not my background at all. Um, I'm a two-spirit Nehio Nitipitikosasan, uh, so a Cree Métis from Treaty 6 territory in northern Saskatchewan. And uh, I've relocated here just over a year ago um, out here to this territory. Um, I want to, uh, um, it to be known that Indigenous groups were here are very different than Indigenous groups from where I'm from. Saskatchewan is home to the Cree, Dene, Soto, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, and Métis peoples. And uh, Amina spoke to the um, original uh, peoples that are from this territory. Um, and I also appreciate the territorial acknowledgement and, uh, you know, as, as, a, as a way to um, remove some of the invisibility and marginalization of Indigenous peoples who are born of this land and, and are come from the center of it in the territories that we're from. And, as Amina mentioned, we're the original caretakers of this land. And, and uh, I, I'm learning as I'm out here, because as I mentioned, it's very different where I'm from, uh, you know, things like our, our caretaking of the land from uh, historical burnings of uh, prairie fires to manage, um, to manage the land, to manage the resources for the buffalo, um, those types of things uh, were just as scientific and uh, um, systematic as, uh, you know, the way that we study things and learn about things in our university settings now. I'm not associated uh, with the Indigenous Placemaking Council, um, but I did see that video just a little while ago, and, and for me, what I know from that video, um, in thinking about me in, in the context of the world around me, is I know as an Indigenous person, when I go into spaces and I feel a reflection of myself or some form of indigeneity, if it's not gonna be Prairie Cree from uh, Saskatchewan, um, you know, my next, my next best in order to see myself represented is going to be uh, Haudenosaunee or uh, Nishnabe out here. Um, I do know what it's like to go into places where I see nothing of myself reflected. And uh, whether that's in um, our structures or in the people around me, uh, what the content of what it is that I'm, what I'm learning. In, uh, I think, I think uh, my work has been, um, I, I guess I'd also like to say I'm, I'm an intergenerational survivor of the Indian residential school system and a child from the 60s scoop generation. And um, the thing that uh, I've probably, I, I say most proud of, but the thing that's been my lifelong work has been over the last 25 years, um, locating and connecting with uh, my birth family. And uh, that took me up until actually uh, two years ago to finally connect and find my last uh, sibling. So I'm the oldest of uh, eight siblings that were born, seven of us that are still living, and all which were systematically taken away from our birth family over um, the course of years that we were born. And it's taken me over 25 years to locate everybody who uh, my siblings were spread out from Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and out here in Ontario. Um, one of the things my brother out here in Ontario said uh, when I was finally able to sit down and, and speak with him um, uh, a couple of years ago, or a year, just over a year ago actually, uh, was about how he knew that he was from um, Saskatchewan and he had no idea about how to find out who he was um, or the community he was from and how he found himself as a, as a young person in Ontario and felt completely lost and, and uh, without uh, recognition of anything in his environment around him, including the actual people. Um, and I, I think that speaks to the importance of place. Indigenous peoples are very, um, our uh, connection to land and the spaces around us is, um, is very intimate and even though you know I, I have my degrees and I work in the university and uh, coming out here a year ago uh, has been extremely challenging for me because of my connection to land and ceremony and um, our medicines and how to harvest plants and uh, those types of things and coming out here it's, it's very different. The birds are different, 
uh, many of the birds are different, the plants are different, um, the seasons are different, so as far as when I would pick or when I would harvest things, that's all changed for me. Um, there's medicines out here that I'm not familiar with that we don't have in Saskatchewan, but uh, my Haudenosaunee friends are, are teaching me about, and uh, so trying to find equivalents of medicines that will work um, for various issues. Um, so there, there's just many, many things that are uh, very, very different, and that's really disorienting for me. Um, one of our more recent discussions, I, I had brought it up a little while ago, but uh, we were looking at buying a TP for the university. We have one, but it's uh, not function, functionable right now. And so we're looking at getting another one. And so I asked about, uh, is that a thing here? Should we have a TP here? I, uh, um, I'm not sure. I know Haudenosaunee. I know there's longhouses, which are very different. We don't have those in the West or in the prairies. Um, and there's also a different structure, a wigwam, which is not at all from the prairies and uh, um, and so we ended up with this discussion and um, people view the teepee as sort of this pan indigenous type of structure and I guess it is sort of a symbol of that but um, it's not necessarily the uh, representation of indigenous structures in this particular territory and um, we are going to go ahead and get one, but we will make sure that we're providing that education at when it's up about the peoples that used a teepee and, and will continue to use that versus uh, the space that we're in, that we're in at this point. Um, what, uh, my, my work has taken me, I, I came into university in uh, Regina and uh, my background a little bit, uh, I took an Indigenous Studies bachelor program and then also a Psychology bachelor's program and then uh, did my master's in adult education. And it was really within my master's program that um, I took it out of Regina because that's where I was positioned and so it made sense, I didn't want to move for it. And um, I took it in adult education because I was already teaching in the in university in the Indigenous Studies and Indigenous Health Studies field. Uh, but uh, I wasn't going to be able to go any further without getting this equivalency sort of training that the institution required. And so I went into this program, I thought I'd get adult ed because I was teaching, and, uh, but there was no Indigenous content throughout at the time and uh, no Indigenous staff or faculty for me to engage with, but um, I was adamant that I was going to do thesis route and that um, at the time, it was my birth mom that wanted uh, to be the central focus of, of uh, my thesis work. And in order to embark and engage within that, I had to uh, come from, I had to have it centered around indigenous ways of knowing, indigenous methodologies, and um, in order for it to uh, have meaning in the way that I wanted and in the way that my uh, family wanted. Uh, and that was a super, super struggle within the university at that time because they had no idea what it was that I was doing. And um, essentially, the short story is, is they hung up my ethics for a year, going back and forth on trying to get ethics approval. First, they decided that my mom was coercing me. And then when I clarified that, they decided that I was coercing my mom. And uh, sorry, the first one was is that I couldn't do it because it was with a family member. Then it was the coercion that went back and forth. And, and each time, if anybody has submitted ethics or tried to get ethics approval, um, you know, there's a turnaround time. So it's not like you're having that direct conversation. You work on it, you get it done, you submit it, you're waiting for the yes. And then, you know, a month later it comes back and it's a no. And then, um, and then you're having to fix all that. And so this, this took a year of my graduate studies. and. Uh, by about the third time, um, I actually just stopped for three months because I was just frustrated and thought, you know, this is, uh, there's no point. I didn't want to do it anymore uh, because it, there wasn't a place for me in the work that I was doing and to do it in a meaningful way. Um, my advisors uh, encouraged me to continue on and uh, obvi obviously I did, but what I ended up doing was this whole other entire piece researching uh, dissertations and thesis work that had been done at uh, a different university. Uh, that had been done in a similar way where there had been support and precedent set for Indigenous research methodology and, and the validity and the academic integrity of uh, what, that, what exists within that. And, um, and then ultimately after a year I got my letter of approval back because uh, they sent it external, they actually sent my ethics external to that university and it got reviewed again and it was the original ethics that I had put forward a year before and it came back with one recommendation 
um, which was a valid recommendation. I had not uh, explicitly spoken to my uh, emotional and spiritual support uh, during, that would be set up for me during my uh, research uh, piece. I had it in there for my, for my mom and family members that were involved. So it was very minor, but unfortunately that uh, hung me up for a year. So I um, sort of, I came to know Indigenous research methodologies and, and how to argue it in the academy um, and um, speak to its validity in a way that uh, made sense only because of the lived experience of doing my master's. Um, currently, as I'm working on my doctorate studies through OISE, it's, uh, thus far, it's like it's a non-issue. So that's um, very nice. A couple of the uh, main scholars that um, that I that I had started learning about earlier on was was a guy named Sean Wilson and he wrote this book called Research is Ceremony and in my undergrad I had taken in my psych degree I had taken uh, research courses um, stats courses and I, well in fact I took stats twice <laughs> same same stats class twice um, I hated it and uh, and I actually took four years off before I did my master's because I just hate it. I didn't see how the way I was thinking was going to work within post-secondary. That's also the reason I did two separate undergrads because I didn't think I could do a master's program in graduate studies with the way I thought. But um, this was the first book that I happened to pick up at the uh, university bookstore uh, that I, I read. And the book that was on research and was scholarly work and I read it basically cover to cover many, many times now. But um, that really spoke to me because I understood everything. It clarified everything that I was thinking and the way I was thinking it and put it in a format that provided me the language to um, incorporate in my work within the institution. And then um, another um, amazing author is Margaret Kovach as well, and she, she writes about um, Indigenous methodologies and speaks a lot about uh, conversational uh, methods, which I can touch on a little bit. Some of the key things with regards Indigenous research and doing Indigenous, uh, following research, Indigenous research methodologies, it, it's not something that everybody needs to take up. Uh, that's not uh, what I'm advocating here for, but um, what I am advocating for is if you are um, uh, non-Indigenous in, in particular and intending on doing a project or some work with Indigenous colleagues or in and with Indigenous people in community, then I strongly encourage you before you even head out in that to educate yourself about what indigenous research methodologies are. That by no, uh, you know, no means uh, means that uh, to go out and tell indigenous people how, uh, you know, indigenous research methodologies um, go, I guess. But um, it does it does mean to do some education yourself first to understand that. There's some very key points um, that have been published by uh, some of our Indigenous scholars uh, that speak to some of the key things within Indigenous research methodology. And, and uh, uh, some refer to the three R's, some refer to four R's. I think there's even a five R's now, but uh, that um, are core to being followed. And one is uh, respect. And so if, if uh, we're looking at, if I'm looking at doing research with um, Indigenous peoples and as an Indigenous scholar, um, it's, it's very different from our Western mind and our, and our scientific mind of where we would study the other, where we, would, where we were so presumptuous to think that we have no bias um, because uh, that's impossible to not have a bias. We all have a, a life and life experience and an educational experience and relationships and everything we do comes from that. It, it, it has to. You can't erase all that in order to come forward and so in Indigenous research, it's very important to situate yourself and understand what you're bringing to the table and, and how you have come to understand things in the way that you've come, come to understand them. And um, with respect, um, if, when engaging with research with Indigenous peoples, there a, there's a, has to be a mutual respect there. If you um, are engaging on a project with the idea of thinking that um, you know, that as the researcher you're somehow no more or are better, then 
then don't bother. Don't, please don't do research with indigenous peoples. Um, our indigenous beliefs and our indigenous philosophy would say just everybody here in the room, we're different ages, we're different uh, genders, we're different um, ethnic backgrounds. We all bring something to the conversation. We all bring our own gifts that we have and that have grown. And some of that will be knowledge in certain areas um, that are different from each other. So as I mentioned, I do not have a background in architecture. I don't know um, next to anything about it other than what I've learned from Amina. And we have some great conversations, but I still wouldn't say I'm talking anything along the lines of architecture. Um, but uh, what I do know is about my indigeneity and about uh, research methodologies uh, with indigenous peoples and, and those types of things. So, so the relationship is, is a level playing field. And so that's where I'm speaking about that respect. You're, you would be bringing a skill of your background specifically in architecture uh, based on your education, but the, any project would be indigenous driven and guided and um, um, on how to move forward. The other, another, one of the R's is, is around reciprocity in that there is um, a, a give and take on the relationship or not a give and take but a, there's reciprocal. There's a benefit. So for example with, um, and that kind of, this kind of goes back to speaking about so much work. We have been studied to death literally as indigenous peoples in this country and um, that has not been helpful for us. And so now uh, we're saying in our, in our tri-council ethics and, and uh, some of the communities, even Six Nations has, I think, their own ethics um, approval as well that you need to go through if you want to do research there or, or with it, people from there, um, is that um, there has to be some sort of reciprocal relationship that uh, whereby there's benefit to and for the indigenous peoples or community that you're doing the work with. Uh, so, for example, in my research with my mom, uh, the benefit was for her, my mom um, does not have the ability to be in an institution like this. To uh, Life has been very, very different for her, primarily um, because of policies of assimilation in this country. Uh, but she's brilliant, uh, she's well read, and uh, she would like to help people and to help people understand how her experiences have um, sort of come about. Uh, but she will never be able to get into the academy to do that herself. So she wanted me to do that for her. So as, and because of our fa familial relationship and our community relationship ties, um, I, have a, I have the ability to do that for her, to help her to do that, to, to provide a space where her experiences can be shared in a broader context to help others learn, which is what she wanted. Because I'm in the institution, because I have, you know, the um, skills to write a book in this, in this format, um, to uh, present that, to help. I, I, use, I use part of her stories in classroom teaching so that other students can learn. Sometimes when I was in Regina, I would bring her uh, if, if she was in a, a good space that day and I was able to. So there's this like ongoing reciprocal relation. I'm also engaged in that relationship even if it wasn't my direct family ongoing. So there's never a completion part. And so that was one of the most challenging things for me actually on my thesis was to sort of like end the thesis part of, of the written part of it um, because the relationship is ongoing. My accountability to share to share the stories of my, of, of my mom, but within there are ongoing from this point forward. That doesn't end. And um, my mom, the part of the benefit that she got was uh, her stories got to be shared. There's also been this extended benefit to my family and other indigenous peoples in my community um, to learn from the things that my mom shared that have also helped them understand better who they are and to understand um, others from the 60s scoop, why they're positioned the way they are, why some of their parents are in the positions that they are. And so it's this uh, reciprocal relationship. Um, it's not about the publication or putting something on the, sh on the shelf. If it's, again, if, if that's um, the kind of project or work that uh, you're interested in, and, and some are, and I'm not saying that's, um, uh, you know, that's important work as well, but 
working with Indigenous peoples is not the place to start doing that work. Do not go out to try and work with Indigenous peoples um, in order to uh, get the money that says you've worked with Indigenous peoples and still get you the publication. You know, we have Indigenous uh, professionals who are coming into, into this field and um, who are, will be interested in doing, engaging in reciprocal relationships and then there will be some non-Indigenous people as well who will be willing to work within that for um, the value for community. Relevance, relevance is another one of the R's and again I, I don't know anything about architecture but I know when I see things like within that video that um, connect with me and the structures and the types of even though some of them are not uh, would not um, resonate in the particular territory that I'm from I do recognize them as indigenous from other locations in this country and uh, and we and and I, I, I so the relevance of the work that you're doing or intending on doing has to have meaning for the indigenous peoples that you're engaging with and it has to be driven by them and so they may be describing things or telling you stories about things that uh, may not fit sometimes with their linear minds of how it is that we you know get to sort of focused on how we need to do things when we're in the institution and so um, the listening and the way that listening occurs is often very different and you're going to hear things through story through um, through uh, social events, through um, through walks, through through any of any of those types of things, and that's different than when we get together uh, in a boardroom and have a meeting or, or something something like this. And so, when I say the listening is is not just um, it's not just like listening like with our ears, but it's like listening, you know, with with your heart and with your eyes and trying to understand something that might be different than the experiences that uh, you bring. And um, I'm not saying not, the, you know, there's, there's uh, many other cultures too that are very land-based and so sometimes, uh, you know, that can be helpful to uh, sort of uh, already have a thought process that understands uh, that connection in that, in that way as well. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's listening in a, different, in a different way and then being guided by that. And, uh, when engaging with Indigenous peoples for research or for anything, I think the biggest thing that uh, we can all do is listen. If we're not interested in listening and taking action based upon what it is that we're hearing, then we probably shouldn't be doing that work. And I put myself in that group because, again, I intentionally came out to a territory that is not my own. Um, there's very different practices out here, and uh, I do a lot of listening. Um, to learn and to um, make sure even in my work in the institution that it's not uh, Métis Cree Prairie guided in the in the ways that I that I that we do things out there but that it's I have the voices of uh, Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe from the territory and um, use my position to make sure that that information is um, at the table and in the conversations. Um, I'm just going to say one more thing and then we'll maybe open up for questions because I actually prefer conversation instead of just talking anyways. But uh, we had a, um, I'm working on a research project right now at, at uh, the university and um, we had a scholar, uh, Trevor Stace, he's an indigenous person. I can't remember now, I didn't put that in my notes where he's from, but he's at Wilfrid Laurier and uh, he shared some, some uh, comments about a project he was doing. Um, it's called the Indigenous Labor History Project, uh, which isn't necessarily particularly important, but um, without having conversation with him and without knowing him, and he was sharing with our Indigenous uh, research assistants and non-Indigenous team, we have a mixed team, uh, he was speaking about some things about how he had to go into, um, just go around and visit and be in community uh, before even starting any of the work. and. Uh, he had converse because he was doing research in a community that wasn't his own and have conversations with real people um, he also recognized that people wanted to participate for different reasons and um, and we have to be okay with that if we're going into uh, indigenous community or working with indigenous community to do research um, 
He said that he didn't focus so much on interviewing a certain number of people per day, but focused on the quality and relationship and trust building. And so oftentimes, I, I, I talk about it as like code switching. Um, I've only kind of really recently sort of named it for myself because I recognize that I do it a lot. And I recognize the, um, if I'm going, for example, to Six Nations at the end of the month, um, I have no set agenda. I have no set times for anything. I'm just taking the day and there's some people that I'm going to converse with. I might be done in an hour or I might be done in eight hours, whatever my day is, and before I come back. But that's what I need to do because I'm still very much in the relationship building process. Um, I'm not taking any senior administration to go introduce them because we don't have a relationship yet in my department to be taking non-Indigenous people to uh, even... Uh, um, as visitors who, who aren't going to be the ones who engage in an ongoing relationship. That's going to be me in this instance. Um, but then when I meet with uh, senior administration at any point in time, it's like, you know, we're down to like exact minutes on our meetings, right? We walk in, the agenda's there, it's just moved right along and we're done and we, and we head out and we feel like we're accomplished within sort of that time period. Um, but that's a different way of doing business and that is not going to be the way um, of engaging with indigenous peoples or, or uh, in, in any regard, even if it's not research, but just con conversing because, because that fundamental trust building, building relationships, engaging, um, give, and, give and take, everybody sharing something, um, something of, of value, whether it's um, a personal value uh, in story that you're sharing or a skill that you're sharing, uh, there's that reciprocal relationship. It's also important, I don't want to, you know, sort of go to a, and, and uh, Trevor mentioned this as well, to not go to a pan-Indigenous, and, and I hope I've been somewhat clear in that. Um, certainly our groups out west are very different than here in Ontario. British Columbia is going to be, as well, very, very different from the prairies and from here. And, uh, and we have north, even in Saskatchewan, uh, the northern uh, the northern Cree versus the southern Plains Cree very different. Um, we have six different dialects of Cree language in this country, alone, and uh, six, so that means six different uh, groups of the of the Cree group um, within itself. We have several dialects of Machif, which is a Métis language, um, and then there's numerous other uh, um, peoples, and so just recognize that there's great diversity and so a great idea of a structure or idea of how to build something out here. For example, when I go on campus and I came out here for my interviews and I saw these totem poles um, near the Indigenous Student Centre and I thought that was highly unusual because, and I thought there must be some particular story behind why they're here because totem poles are um, from West Coast culture, they're not, they're not in the prairies, and they're not out here, but um, when Indigenous people travel to other territories, we are expecting to see the, a reflection of the Indigenous groups of that territory. We are not expecting to see, I'm not expecting to see my Cree culture reflected to me in the structures around here. I'm expecting to see longhouses, wigwams, other structures, not not uh, teepees and, and, and other things like that. I think it's, um, I, uh, I've watched uh, a couple times and I just got frustrated. I happened to be on, like it's like International House Hunters or something, where people go to other countries and it's primarily would be Americans um, that, are, that I'm seeing on that. Sh I only saw it a couple times because I just, I like the beautiful sights, but I didn't like the way people spoke in it. And, and, and they're going to some really, really unique place and yet they want this like huge, American house and are offended when the space in the house isn't like doesn't look like their house in the United States and um, I think this is a very presumptuous attitude and when we go to other places um, are we trying to sort of inseminate something upon or you know sort of germinate something from the land and the people and the cultures that are there as indigenous peoples we really think about it as as uh, you know what comes up and is born of that land within those territories and uh, yeah so I think I'll leave it at that right now I don't know if I covered anything that you wanted or nothing that you wanted but uh, I'm open for questions or conversation mm -hmm. um, 
if you're looking at how lost on it, um, uh, I wrote a book last year by Wade Travis, uh, who's a scholar at the University of British Columbia. He's an anthropologist and he was a case study by very diverse um, indigenous community, basically one of every continent, and their relationship between uh, their people, their culture, and the land that they from, um, with the sort of larger thesis that uh, we are living in a globalized world. And every day, um, a culture, whether it is uh, a sort of local culture, whether it's an Aboriginal culture, um, whether it is a sort of ethnic minority that has established its own type of culture, the city, uh, those are all scary as we move into a more globalized world. Um, and so, how do you kind of see, uh, maybe not how do you see, but do you have any suggestions for ways in which we can kind of prevent that loss of knowledge. Because every culture, no matter how small, um, has its own relationship to its landscape, mm -hmm. has its own relationship to its environment, uh, and has those strategies for survival. Um, and ultimately, globalization is this kind of weird, everybody somehow becomes a part of something that nobody's actually tied to it. And more importantly, in the context of climate change, um, there is no one global solution Mm -hmm. to address our relationship to our African environment. So, mm -hmm. I don't know, how yeah. would you so, that? So I think um, a couple of things. As indigenous peoples, we, um, we have a unique history being that we are the original peoples of this land. And um, other, you know, even in my Scottish side, like, came um, back, I, I, I know all the way back to, uh, um, my ancestor who came specifically with the uh, British or with the uh, Black Watch Brigade to fight the Indians came in through that's the language to fight the Indians came up through the states and three generations later is married uh, and, and uh, you know full-fledged into um, Métis culture who then marries back into also Cree culture and and uh, that shifts but I, th I think one of the unique things is about the indigenous peoples and the landscape is that that is original to this territory we can't go anywhere else to get it we can't go back to um, another country to try and find that and so i think we have um, you know a social responsibility i would hope to um, maintain that in the way that indigenous peoples of local territories want um, that being said it also doesn't have to stay static in how it was you know, 500 years ago. So um, different structures, uh, cultures evolve over time and so has indigenous culture. And we especially see that in our musicians and our artists who are, you know, blending powwow music with like uh, hip hop and rap and um, our artists who are, um, you know, taking up all these other forms. They're still indigenous artists. There's still that history that can be told through what it is that they're bringing. And I would see that any profession and, and, and uh, in your profession as well would kind of uh, move along like that as well. I think um, anthropology, I think indigenous peoples primarily fell, down, fell under anthropological studies because we were not meant, it was never intended that we would still exist. And so um, you'll see a lot of, um, uh, you say anthropology and most indigenous people will just like want to walk away pretty fast right now. Um, and, and our work is sort of taking up, taken up um, uh, elsewhere, but um, I was going to say a point about that though. As far as globalization goes, I think we use globalization primarily in a couple, in different ways. We use globalization and connection through our social media and, and global indigenous peoples elsewhere, which also comes from that term because it unites us globally as indigenous peoples. And so we use that term in reference to, um, a definition came out of the United Nations uh, originally in 70s maybe, uh, which was about uniting uh, original peoples of the land, of the, of the original land, uh, who had a common um, history of being colonized. And so that's where uh, the idea of indigenous came out. And that unites us globally as indigenous peoples, to, as original peoples of the land, having that common history of um, being colonized. Um, and when we speak to each other, 
uh, internationally when I am speaking to my colleagues in, in Australia. It's not about trying to take on um, uh, Australian um, anything here. It's about uniting on how we're going forward, maintaining our indigeneity in our places of, of uh, origin and, and how we can unite on that front. It's not about um, you know, trying to create uh, any sort of pan-indigenous sort of culture. Um, I think we're all, at this point, I don't know, in 150 or 200 years, you know, how that might shift. But I think because um, our history in this country has been, it went very pan-indigenous as though we were all the same right from colonization. Uh, everybody referred to as Indian, our, our individual identities of our individual tribes was lost, um, our cultures were lost, and uh, or certain, or were, uh, you were jailed for practicing or killed, um, and we were segregated and locked up on reserves in order to uh, get rid of that identity and we were not intended to um, exist at this point in time. And cultures I think that have been through experiences like that then spend a lot of years and a lot of generations trying to reclaim that identity, the resurgence of trying to um, understand that and get that back and uh, be um, succeed with that. And once that occurs, uh, who knows? I, you know, I don't know where, you know, how our globalization will affect us as Indigenous peoples. But I, I think my experience, and I'm pretty politically active. <laughs> and uh, and uh, internationally as well, well and, and I think our globalization is seems to be for different intents. It's not. It's about um, getting. I don't want to say getting ahead, but like figuring out ways to maintain ourselves in our lands of origin. Even to the extent that we even talk. And I said this in my interview. If you have an indigenous person from that territory that is qualified, and. Uh, um, a solid candidate, better than me, definitely you should be hiring them, or close to where you think that I'm at, you need to hire them because they're from that territory. And I said that uh, when I met with the students and I came out here for my on-site because I think that's important. Um, you know, we don't want to romanticize or exoticize the indigenous from somewhere else um, because that's generally we want to be working in our, in our home territories. Um, and that's generally where uh, we seem to end up at this point in time. And uh, we're, we're pretty clear that within our culture still. Yeah. I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, no, you know, but your friend I think that, you know, swapping any type of um, hand and culture. Mm -hmm. I think my, my concern, my kind of question is really, uh, given that you know we are connected more and more every day, we are seeing um, individual cultures um, across the globe, you know, micro cultures that are just disappearing overnight because they're kind of being swallowed mm. into mm. you know larger micro cultures. Um, that and we're losing our regionalism, we're losing um, our connectivity to. Uh, our actual environment as we become more and more concerned with right. what's going on around the world. And I'm just curious more how we actually um, stay local, how we really focus on our place uh, and, and the ideas um, of that place and, and the relationship uh, to the community. And um, I don't want to romance as historical, but sort of historical way of um, interacting with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think, you know, if, if it's other cultures as well or, or new cultures that are here, I, I think it's partly having conversations and how they want um, representation or what, how they uh, want things around them and, and what, pieces, what pieces of that can professionals in your field help support them with uh, presenting. Um, how did so? I mean, that would be my advice. It, it's kind of I always say, um, you know, generally speaking, if you ask, um, you know, most people, uh, you know, things in a in a respectful way, you're going to get a respectful answer, and um, that would be the first thing that that I that I would be doing. But uh, I think being mindful, like that, there's a social conscious and, and an interest in this. I think is is a starting point. 
because lots don't even have that. So I, I think that's important. If people think that's important, some don't. So, yeah. Right, so, um, so my work in the area of what we're calling here at this university, indigenization, um, has, has uh, um, I've been doing it for a lot of years out west, and uh, to the extent that some of our work out there were on, um, I think I was, uh, you know, we're in like the third year of our second round of a strategy of what we were doing. Um, you know, which means we were doing it over 10 years ago. Um, and and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's new, and so we're all figuring out. No post-secondary is there, no, no classrooms are entirely there, like it's new. And it's also, um, location is also important. So even, so what will work here at the University of Waterloo and what will work within different program areas will be different from each other. What works at University of Waterloo is gonna be different than Western or, or uh, um, any other university out here and certainly out west and that's okay that's just that's that's the way it is um, one of the things that uh, sometimes and, and this may not be what you're asking but I just also wanted to state this is uh, sometimes people think that um, maybe we're calling on non-indigenous people to teach things that might be like cultural in nature and that uh, is not is not the case what I would see it and, and this would take a lot longer discussion but um, some of the things that have occurred here in the last year that, I, that I've known about are um, that faculty can do within their curriculum is like looking at who is it that you're teaching, what scholars, what professionals um, are you following and are you presenting to your students and um, it's our natural human inclination that we learn best from people that we see ourselves most represented in. This is just basic psychology um, and our classrooms when we go into teaching we tend to showcase uh, work again that we see ourselves most reflected in. So um, unfortunately, the default has always been uh, white, <laughs> white bureau Canadian or, or uh, um, sort of uh, default. And so um, we saw this, for example, when uh, women scholar, women scholars weren't uh, included in any of the scholarly work. And so. Um, and then once women were in institutions, their work wasn't valued as scholarly, but um, we started to see a shift in that, in that um, there's work of, uh, scholar scholarly work of women included within all disciplines um, now, and it's presented within the classroom. And so part of it is, is looking at the area of uh, the courses that you teach and finding out um, who's doing indigenous, what indigenous scholars or professionals are doing work in that area. And if your students are looking at six different pieces of something or case studies, you know, make sure that there's a diversity within there. Um, it's not always necessarily to speak for it or about it, except for from knowing your positionality within that. So for example, I do speak about some things that I've learned uh, within uh, this territory, but I'm very clear I am not Haudenosaunee. This is not my practice. Um, I don't know, uh, I'm, I'm learning just a little, little bit about the two row wampum. We don't have those kinds of treaties where I'm from, we're from the number treaties. Um, but position, position, the situating yourself is significantly important and um, it may seem new for non-Indigenous people in a, a place like the academy or whatever, but for Indigenous peoples, it's, we've always done things that way. And uh, it's okay, like it's, it's difference is okay, but uh, it helps us to understand each other and relate to one another. And so, sorry, and so sometimes then if I might speak a little bit about something that's in this territory, but generally speaking, I will bring in people who can best represent themselves because it's them. So even the class I'm teaching this semester, I think I brought in four different speakers to speak on some specific things that um, are not really mine to speak about. Granted, that's a current issues in Indigenous uh, communities topic that I'm teaching, but yeah. And that's okay. And, and we need to pressure the, the institutions, right, to support us in that, uh, because that's important. Um, it's not about um, speaking for, we want, we want to be 
in these spaces. We want to have opportunities and we want to be professors and, and work in these professions. It's, it's not about sort of taking it, at the, taking it up at the exclusion, uh, to continue the exclusion of Indigenous peoples, but to um, provide opportunities, yeah. Thank you so much, Lori. Thank you all for coming.